Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Randy Horwitz. I'm the medical director at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. I'd like to welcome everyone to Integrative Medicine Day 2023, honoring the field, and in this session, perhaps the person most responsible for its inception. Now, many of you probably know Dr. Andrew Weil through his 17 some odd books, TV podcast appearances. I thought I'd give you a couple facts you may not already know. Andy got his undergrad degree in biology from Harvard concentrating in botany and wrote his senior thesis on the narcotic properties of the common spice nutmeg. In fact, as a researcher, Dr. Weil published scientific studies in both science and nature, two of the most esteemed scientific journals. As a student, uh, Andy served as editor of the daily campus paper, the Harvard Crimson, and also its humor publication, the Harvard Lampoon. Uh, that puts him among the ranks of Conan O'Brien, William Randolph Hearst, and John Updike, who had similar roles. But most important to me and to this day is, is how often in your lifetime do you get to hear from the pioneer of a field? We all know experts in fields, uh, the father of modern cardiology or hematology, but it's rare to meet the creator of a field. Andrew Weil is a paradigm shifter. He challenged our approach to patients as well as our underlying assumptions about health and healing, and in the process, created a movement that has flourished. So let me turn it over to Dr. Andrew Weil, who will reflect on this journey. Thank you, Randy. Uh, what a nice introduction, and hello to everybody. Uh, what a wonderful concept, Integrative Health Day. And by the way, I think it, it is important to say integrative health and not just integrative medicine, because uh, we also want to acknowledge the contributions of the nursing profession, uh, the pharmacy profession, and allied health professionals in this movement toward integrative health. The word integrative means bringing together. It's, it's combining things. And that's what I have tried to do. Now, I have great respect for conventional medicine for the areas in which it does very well. Um, you know, it is very good at managing trauma, at acute crises, at severe illness. Uh, it's not very good at managing the epidemics of chronic disease that we have in our society today. Um, I, and I think it's important for patients to learn when to use conventional medicine, when not to use it first, and if you do use it, how to combine it with other methods that can lower the risk of harm and increase efficacy. At the Center for Integrative Medicine, we train health professionals, physicians, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, and allied health professionals. And for physicians, we try to remedy the deficiencies in conventional education, starting with nutrition is a big one, as you know, that is still really slighted in medical education. Um, we also emphasize what we call whole person medicine, meaning that um, we look not just at the physical body, but at the mental emotional aspect of human beings and the spiritual aspect and their membership in communities. Uh, we also place a great deal of emphasis on lifestyle. Uh, I think lifestyle medicine is one of the most important components of integrative health, and it offers the possibility of real prevention. Um, I think this is the meat of preventive medicine, is teaching people how to make better rather than worse lifestyle choices to influence health and risks of disease. I think the for me, uh, one of the biggest components that is left out uh, of conventional healthcare is this is the mind body component. Um, I have again and again seen in my career that the roots of illness lie not in the physical realm, but in the non physical realm, and that if you ignore that, you often are not able to solve long standing problems. I've written up many such cases in my books. And I refer you particularly to two early books, Spontaneous Healing and Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, which have a lot of case histories of patients that I've worked with who had very dramatic uh, healings as a result of using integrative approaches. Let me tell you about one, a good friend of mine. Uh, when this happened, he was 24 years old. He was uh, uh, very athletic, in good shape, a university professor. Uh, he liked to play basketball. And out of the blue, he had an episode of very severe lower back pain, not triggered by anything. 
Um, it lasted for several weeks. It really frightened him, and then it faded away. And then this recurred uh, at odd intervals. It got worse each time. It was disabling. He began to see um, massage therapists, physical therapists, and finally uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons who did various scans and told him that he had two herniated discs. One of them was shattered into fragments. They thought this was a, a, a very dire condition. Uh, he was given various things to try, including uh, significant doses of opioids and Valium, which would dull the pain for a while. But it kept recurring. It began affecting one leg as well. So he developed sciatica. Uh, again, disappeared for a while, then came back worse than before, and finally was so bad that uh, he felt that he had to do something, and the surgeons told him his only recourse was surgery. When I saw him, I told him that I wanted, he was in New York, I told him I wanted to, to see a physician named John Sarno. He died a few years ago. He was a rehabilitation uh, medicine doctor who developed a unique theory of back pain. He said that most back pain is due to a syndrome he called tension myositis. Myositis means inflammation of the muscles. Uh, and he said that the primary cause of this is in the mind uh, and that that's where things have to be dealt with. So he said there's a vicious cycle in which small muscles in the back constrict, restrict blood flow to muscles and that the muscle spasm is the source of the pain. And while this can locate at areas of physical injury, such as a herniated disc, it's not the disc that's causing the pain. It's this, uh, this vicious cycle of muscle spasm. And he said that it's perfectly possible to live with herniated discs and other structural problems and not have pain. Um, his main method of treating people was to have them come to two evening lectures and also to read his books. And there are many stories of people who were quite skeptical but listen to him talk about tension myositis syndrome and their pain miraculously disappeared. My friend was very, very skeptical of all this. He thought this was new age nonsense. Uh, he met Sarno. Uh, he, he was days away from having surgery, uh, went to the two evening lectures, thought this was ridiculous, uh, went to out to dinner and in the midst of the dinner suddenly realized the pain was not there. And while it did come back in lesser degree over the next few months, it finally went away completely and he became a total convert to this idea. Um, Sarno said that the vast majority of incidents of chronic pain, especially back pain, are due to this kind of muscle problem. Uh, and I think it's very interesting, the more that I've looked into this, that there's a very low correlation between structural findings in people's backs as you see them on x-rays and scans and their symptoms. Uh, you can find people whose scans look so bad, you can't imagine that they could sit or stand and they have no pain, no symptoms. And others whose scans and x-rays look normal who are disabled by pain. So that fact is very interesting that there, that there is such a low correlation between uh, these images that we find and, and symptoms. And I have again and again found this to be true. It's very hard sometimes to convince people of the reality of this because um, patients are often very sensitive to being told or, or thinking that you're telling them that they're making it all up, that it's all in their mind. And that's not the point. It's not all in the mind. It is in the mind and the body, but there is a very, very intimate connection between those two. And they influence each other and their ways of modifying physical conditions by working on the mind. Um, after I got out of my uh, clinical training, uh, I took a course in medical hypnosis at Columbia University for physicians, uh, and one of the best courses I've ever taken. And I was so uh, excited at what I learned there that I began to refer patients to hypnotherapy, and I found hypnotherapists that I partnered with, um, and I have seen excellent results uh, with this. I think there is really nothing that's off limits to this kind of mind-body approach. There are other ones as well. There's guided imagery, there's uh, visualization, uh, there's biofeedback, there's a range of these mind-body techniques. Uh, they are very underutilized in conventional healthcare, even though they are... Uh, the chance of causing harm with them is minimal. They're cost effective. Uh, they can be strikingly medically effective. And they're even fun, both for patients and practitioners, but we don't use them that much. 
The reason is that conventional medicine and healthcare are very limited by the materialistic paradigm that dominates our form of science and certainly our medicine. Uh, materialists believe that the only reality is physical reality. And if you observe a change in a physical system, the cause has to be physical. Non-physical causation of physical events is not allowed for in that way of thinking. And I think that has greatly limited the effectiveness of conventional medicine and healthcare. Uh, as I said, I have seen again and again that the roots of chronic problems lie not in the body, but outside of the physical sphere. And by working with that, you can change things. And, and again, I would refer you to some of my books to read cases of this sort. And I've seen things of this in my own body quite dramatically. I'll tell you a story from my own personal experience. Uh, this is, um, I don't know how long ago, it was some years ago. I was traveling back to my home in Tucson, Arizona from the Pacific Northwest. And I stopped at the home of a friend of mine in Washington state who had a hot, an outdoor hot tub. And I'm usually very careful about hot tubs that I get into. And this one looked a little iffy to me, but I got in and soaked in it. And uh, about 24 hours after I was in it, I developed a, I got what seemed like a pustule on my upper arm. And then I began to get several of these. They were sore, red. Um, and I tried to squeeze them to see if I get anything out of them, but I couldn't. Um, it was, they were painful. I felt unwell. By the time I got home, I had one, two on my face, which was very alarming. And I knew what this was. This is a condition called hot tub folliculitis. And it's usually due to an organism, a bacterial organism called pseudomonas, which is notoriously difficult to get rid of. I didn't want to start on antibiotics. I tried putting hot compresses on it. Um, and I, I kept you know, squeezing, which was probably not a good idea. And uh, my wife at the time said, why don't you call our friend uh, who was had just become certified as a guided imagery practitioner? And I said, oh, come on, what is guided imagery going to do for a bacterial infection? But I was persuaded to do it. I called her on the phone and she said she would do a session with me on the phone. So I remember sitting on the couch in my home and I was cradling the, uh, this is before cell phones, I was cradling the receiver in my shoulder. And she told me to relax and to breathe and get into a, a, a light trance state. And then she asked me to pick the, the lesion that was causing me most, most problems. And it was the one on my, uh, um, I think it was like right about here. Uh, it was big and red and angry. And she said, uh, put yourself there and and see what color it is and my what I saw was swirling uh, red energy that was trapped there and she said what what is it telling you and so I tried to listen and the message I got was that I was trying to make it leave by squeezing it to come out of my body and, and it said it couldn't leave that way that it had to be absorbed uh, into my body and 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 processed and she said well in that case what should you be doing and i said well i probably should be resting and i got a thought of eating garlic uh and and sending it a message that you know it it could go inside and i would try to neutralize it my wife said that when I got off the phone, she could see a difference in the way these uh, lesions looked. Uh, I didn't. But the next morning, clearly this condition was on the way out. And after about, I think, 48 hours, it was gone. I was really amazed that, that uh, this kind of mind-body approach could deal with uh, what seemed like an aggressive bacterial infection that was getting worse and worse. And as a result of that, I've been very enthusiastic about referring patients to uh, these, this kind of therapy. So uh, to me, this is one of the most exciting potentials of this field of integrative health. That is to really bring to credibility the whole uh, interactions of mind and body and to legitimize mind-body medicine and to make this a, a, a cornerstone, a foundational part of a new healthcare system that we build. So I hope you'll you'll learn about some of these things, read about these cases that I describe uh, in, in my books, and, and then try them for yourselves. I want to talk a bit about an, another foundational principle of integrative health and medicine, and that is respect for the body's intrinsic healing capacity. 
to me, this is the most wonderful fact of human biology that our bodies have the ability to know when they have been injured or not working right, uh, to repair damage, uh, to regenerate tissue, to adapt to injury and loss. Uh, you know, and this is at every level of biological organization, even down to the DNA molecule. You know, that's just a big molecule in the interface of life and non-life, but it has within it the ability to know uh, when it has been injured, say, by a cosmic ray that knocks a piece of it out, and instantly it begins to elaborate repair enzymes that cut out the damaged piece, synthesize a correct piece, and paste it back in. You know, it's cut and paste on a molecular level. And this ability, which you can see in DNA, exists in, as I said, in every level of biological organization, in organelles and cells and tissues and organs. It's something we can observe on, in, on the surface of the body. Uh, you get a cut and you can watch how the body repairs itself, but this goes on internally as well. I find that most people that I meet lack confidence in their body's ability to heal. And that's, to me, where good healthcare starts and where good medicine should start. Uh, when I'm with a patient, always at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, why is healing not happening here? Because healing is the rule rather than the, than the, the exception. Uh, and what can I do from outside that can facilitate that process? You know, medicine does not cure. Medicine facilitates healing, which is intrinsic to the organism. That's really not taught in, in uh, standard medical education. And it's the first principle of integrative medicine and integrative healthcare. Um, and I, I think one of, the, one of my jobs and that of people I train is to help give people more confidence in their own body's ability to take care of itself. You know, if you treat it with minimal respect, uh, and that brings us to this area of lifestyle medicine, you know, about making better rather than worse choices. I think the cornerstones of, of healthy lifestyle are learning how to eat right, uh, learning to be physically active throughout life. That doesn't mean necessarily going to gyms or working with trainers, um, getting adequate rest and sleep, um, learning, learning and practicing methods of neutralizing the harmful effects of stress. Uh, my personal favorite are simple breathing techniques. And before I end, I will go over the 478 breath with you, which is my personal favorite because it's so time effective and, and uh, just remar has remarkable effects. I think also getting adequate rest and sleep, uh, learn having maintaining good social relationships. You know, these are the basic keys of healthy lifestyle choices. It's not that hard. If you look at nutrition, um, you know, this has become a very complicated subject, and we have so many people out there saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. I mean, the first rule of eating well for optimum health is simply to avoid eating refined, processed, and manufactured foods. You know, it's that simple. Try not to eat food that's made, you know, by someone else. You know, learn how to make simple uh, healthy food with good ingredients yourself, but it's that all that refined processed manufactured food, which I think is really undermining health in our society, and is largely responsible for the epidemics we're seeing of obesity beginning in childhood, uh, hypertension, type two diabetes, you know, all of these problems and also shortening, shortening lives. Um, as I said, not complicated to learn that, um, again, you can go to my website for information on that, drwild.com or my books. So I, I'm sure that um, many of you are, are familiar with the 478 breathing technique. Um, it's, it's been so well publicized. I learned this from um, an elderly osteopathic physician who I had the good fortune to uh, have as a mentor um, when I was in my 40s and was first living in Tucson, Dr. Robert Fulford. Uh, he's one of the most remarkable healers that I've met uh, and used simple manipulation to successfully treat a variety of conditions. Um, when I first met him, he was in his 80s. Uh, he charged $35 for a visit, used really no technology just hands-on. And the first thing that I saw him do repeatedly 
was to end cycles of recurrent ear infections, middle ear infections in kids, you know, a very common problem. Um, and he, he said that the that recurrent ear infections in kids, the root cause was improper breathing. Uh, that breathing is the force that pumps the lymphatic circulation. If breathing is restricted in any way, there are stagnant fluid conditions that build up in the middle ear that provide a perfect breeding ground for bacteria. And he said you could wipe out the bacteria all you wanted with antibiotics, but if you didn't deal with that underlying problem, the infections would come back. And that's certainly what we see in conventional uh, pediatric medicine, that kids have recurrent cycles of ear infections, they're given recurrent cycles of antibiotics, sometimes tubes are put in the ear to equalize pressure, it tends not to go away. He would end that cycle with one treatment of very gentle manipulation that was designed to change breathing. And often when kids would get up from his table, you could see their chests expanding more, uh, more, and they'd never get another ear infection. I mean, that was one of the most remarkable experiences that I had in my uh, studies of other kinds of medicine and other healing techniques. And uh, Dr. Fulford uh, really impressed on me the healing power of nature not a new idea this is something that hippocrates emphasized in the fifth century bc he said revere the healing power of nature but i really didn't learn about that in my medical education so dr fulford taught me this uh, four seven eight breath which is a yoga technique thousands of years old i mean i i don't take credit for it although i'm commonly called the person that introduced this uh, if you google my name and four seven eight breath you'll see videos of me teaching it. It's a very simple technique. The basic method is to uh, breathe in quietly through your nose to a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven, and blow air out forcefully through your mouth to a count of eight, and repeat that for four breath cycles. Um, and that's it. And But this is a practice that you have to do this regularly, religiously, at least twice a day. And over time, if you do this, there are remarkable changes that happen in the function of the involuntary nervous system. This increases parasympathetic tone, the relaxation response, decreases sympathetic tone, which in most people in our society is an overdrive. And the effects are very dramatic in terms of lowered blood pressure, improved digestion, lowered heart rate, um, improved circulation. It's the most effective anti-anxiety technique that I've ever found. Um, it will help you fall asleep. It has everything to recommend it. But as, again, it's a practice. You have to do it regularly. It may take four to six weeks before you really see the full benefits of it. So let me demonstrate it for you. And then uh, we can do it together and I'll count for you. So it looks like this. So that's all. Uh, let's let's try this together. So first, let all the air out through your mouth. Close your mouth. Breathe in through your nose. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Close in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's it. Now just breathe normally and notice how you feel. Some, some of you might feel a little lightheaded doing that the first time. That's not the goal and will disappear with practice. You may have some sense of relaxation that will become very powerful as you practice this. Again, you have to do this at least twice a day. 
no more than four breath cycles at one at one time you can repeat the exercise as often as you want but for the first month no more than four breath cycles after a month if you're comfortable with it you can increase to eight breath cycles and that's the absolute maximum uh and and please stick with it because you'll see the real benefits of this after about uh you know four weeks six weeks of regular practice after you know when you get comfortable with it you can try try using it for things um if somebody cuts you off in traffic if somebody says something that pushes your button do the breathing exercise before you relax uh, before you react try it to help you fall asleep if you get up in the middle of the night for any reason and as i said this is the most powerful anti-anxiety method i have ever found it makes the drugs that we use for anxiety look very weak by comparison um I, I, and this is something simply not on the radar of conventional healthcare. And to me, it's an example of what integrative medicine can do. We can bring into the mainstream methods that are not dependent on expensive technology, but are very effective. And I think this is how integrative health, integrative medicine really can transform healthcare in our society. It can lower costs and improve outcomes. And we desperately need that kind of change. And it all starts with acknowledging and, and revering the body's intrinsic capacity for healing, and then using methods that are using the least invasive, least harmful methods possible as demanded by the circumstances of illness. So for example, in, uh, in our approach to patients, uh, we certainly do not avoid the use of medication, but if medication is necessary, we start with the lowest dose of the least potent agent. And this is always in the context of lifestyle change with changing diet, changing patterns of physical activity, using mind-body approaches, uh, using natural remedies whenever possible, and then using medication if necessary. So uh, this is, I think, a, a great opportunity to think about, you know, what integrative health, health means, what integrative medicine means. Now, I've been writing and saying the same things about medicine, health, healthcare for, geez, 45 years, something like that. And it's been very gratifying to me to watch the change that's happening in our society. Uh, you know, in the early years, uh, nobody much paid attention to what I was saying. Then I got a larger and larger following in the general public, but none of my medical colleagues paid any attention to me. And then starting in the 1990s, when the economics of healthcare began to go south, uh, institutions began to open to what patients had been demanding. And now we're really seeing the mainstreaming of this philosophy. Um, and it's, as I said, extremely gratifying to me. And I feel very fortunate that uh, we found a home at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. We have a new building going up right in the medical campus. Uh, we're growing. We have graduated over 3,000 physicians from our intensive fellowship. We train all sorts of allied health professionals. And uh, I think the future of integrative health is very bright. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Weil, for sharing your experience and your wisdom with us. Um, I'll remind everyone that integrative health uh, is not just one day per year, but um, our center, the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, offers courses and teaching. You can look us up on the web, and it's something we can all practice every day. I also want to remind people that uh, if you signed up for it, and I think you still can on our website, we have a meditation scheduled at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is three and a half hours from now with Dr. Anne-Marie Chiesan. Uh, she is our director of our fellowship, and she will have a guided meditation at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. You can register for it, I think, still on our website, uh, the Andrew Wall Center for Integrative Medicine. So thank you everyone for participating and have a great day and a great week.